morning, church. Yes, good. We're here. Are you, do you feel warm together? Yes, it's good. It's good because if you go outside, it's just evil out there. Good. So happy Sabbath. Glad you are here. Want to give a special welcome to everyone watching online, uh, especially all of you people out there in California. You think you enjoyed the sun. No, no, we have snow. It's beautiful. We can make snow angels. Yeah, amen. That's right. We don't need that Californian weather, but we're glad that you're here <laughs> and watching. Um, at this time, right, we have, we have communion, right? I love communion. And I'm not sure what you think about when you, when you think about communion. Um, maybe you think about foot washing and the emblems. And when you th begin to think about foot washing, right, that could help you to go back and think about Easter weekend and that night before Jesus died and when he washed his disciples' feet at that Last Supper. And if you think about that, that might lead you to remember what they were celebrating. They were celebrating Passover, this time when God showed up and gave his people another chance. And so as we celebrate communion together in this opportunity to wash feet, yeah, it's kind of a twofold thing. Yes, we do this in remembrance and in celebration about how God always gives us another chance. But then we wash each other's feet, because recognizing the reality and the beauty that we give as a church family, we give each other, always give each other another chance. So at this time... Um, we have a couple of different options. We will uh, ha celebrate foot washing as a part of communion um, right now. And so you can, you have a couple of options. You can stay here and think and pray and meditate and listen to some beautiful music um, here in the sanctuary as you think about how God shows up and always gives us another chance. And we think about together, what does it look like and sound like for us to give each other as a church family another chance. But you also are free to go and move into the fellowship hall where we can wash each other's feet as we celebrate and remember Jesus's model of, of, of doing this, which means open communion. Anyone and everyone is welcome to participate um, in the emblems and in washing of feet. So I want you to be aware of that. Um, also want you to know, and then I'm just going to pray, um, that uh, for the live stream audience, uh, Pastor Carl is going to say a, a nice little message to everyone watching online. So you're not going to hear him necessarily. So, you know, he's going to be up here. And he's going to look like he's talking, and he is, but he's not really talking to you. He's talking to everyone online. So, so it's not about you for a second, okay? So just know that. Uh, so I'm going to pray, and then we'll move forward in worship and celebration together as a family. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for community. We thank you for church. We thank you for this opportunity to remember how you always give us another chance. Always give us another chance. So thank you. So as we participate in communion and in worship and we think about your amazing love, and as we leave some of us right now to go and wash each other's feet, perhaps there's something that, uh, that we need to offer and give someone else another chance within our own community. So I pray that you bless us, that you teach us more about you and your incredible love and incredible power uh, right now through this. So thank you for church. Thank you for community in this time. And uh, we look forward to how you will continue to lead and guide us as a community. The direction and the people you are calling us to be. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, greetings to our viewers at Loma Linda Broadcasting Network, as well as those joining us live stream. Uh, this is Communion Sabbath, and in our Adventist tradition, uh, we try to emulate the one who said, I did not come to be served, but rather to serve. And so at this time, many of our people are going uh, to different the church to actually wash one another's feet, as Jesus did uh, back the original. Twelve days. 
Welcome to worship at Kettering Adventist Church. This is your K-Life Update. Mark Gunger's Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage is this Saturday evening and this Sunday morning. If you haven't gotten your tickets yet, don't worry, we'll be selling tickets at the door. Coming up this February on the 16th at 4 p.m., we will be having a memorial service for Cleta Nelson, so please come out. Here at Kettering Church, we're transferring to a new accounting system. What we need from you is to update all of your information with the church office. We've created a quick form on our website to make the process easier. Check out the link below. The time has finally come for a groundbreaking ceremony for our new Children's Ministry Center. Join us February 9th at 3 p.m. after a fellowship meal for a special dessert extravaganza to kick off the event. Everyone is welcome to come, so we hope to see you there. Also note that as of February 11th, due to construction, the north side of Stonebridge Road is going to be closed off, so please plan your drives accordingly. My name is Brandon Stivers, and this has been your K-Life Update. Church. I tell my Central State Corps many times how uh, much of a singing church this is, uh, so they are looking forward to hear you sing with them. So why don't you stand as we sing hymn number 306, Draw Me Nearer. Believe it or not, the offering can be the fun part. And I was thinking about um, what it represents, that it's, it's um, a cheerful giver, right? Okay, you know what that cheerful means? It means that we expect that we are confident of the much more. Okay? So as believers in Christ, brothers and sisters, we get to walk as we give from the heart with a heart full of gratitude, it's because we are living in the exceedingly abundance of God's grace. Okay, so how much more? Okay, let me tell you. 
How much more glorious is the ministry of righteousness? How much more the blood of Christ cleanses our consciousness from the acts that lead to death? How much more we receive God's abundant provision of grace? How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved? How much more? We are safe from God's wrath. Can I give it a hallelujah on that one? Amen. How much more? Valuable. We are valuable as people of God. That's how much more. And the last thing, or the couple more things, how much more? Because he gives us the Holy Spirit because we ask him. And he will even clothe us. So we live because we're new covenant people in the abundance of Christ. We give because he gave to us first. Amen. And so I want to close with this because this is how much fun this can be. Because when we think about the how much more, Ephesians 3.20 sums it up. Immeasurably more. More than we can ask or more than we can even imagine. You know what that word immeasurably means? Beyond more. Amen. Above more. Amen. In Christ, we are that rich. And that's why we give, brothers and sisters, we walk in the miraculous, do we not? Amen. In the provisional grace of Jesus Christ. So let us pray. Oh God, you are a good shepherd. You made it clear to us as our good shepherd that we do not lack anything. We have more than enough in Christ. We are so rich in you. So Lord, we are confident it's by faith we give because we know that you are a good God, a generous God. And we we'll expect and look forward to what you're about to do in our hearts personally to our finances, and what you're going to do in the ministry of this church. We give you all the glory, for we know all good things come from you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The king cried, oh.
Amen. Central State University Chorus. Thank you. Oh, my goodness, right? I'm not wrong on this, right? My goodness, you are the consummate high Sabbath. Wherever you are, there we experience high Sabbath in the presence of God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you people. Thank you for joining us. Wow, what a blessing. And the offering appeal, that was not average. I was so excited just listening. I could hardly wait to give an offering. So it's good to be in church, amen? Well, today we conclude our series called Our Blueprint. We've been studying through the book of Ephesians where the Apostle Paul has answered some of the big questions in life about our church. Why are we here? What's the whole purpose of church, right? And time and again, we've heard the Apostle Paul tell us we are here to live and to love like Jesus. Keep in mind, of course, this is the same Apostle who pinned arguably the most profound statement on the topic of love ever written, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. And then the statement I particularly love, love keeps no record of wrongs. Because this weekend we are focusing our attention on healthier, stronger marriages, bringing in Mark Gunger, who will be here tonight for a marriage seminar. Starts at 7 o'clock, I hope All of you can join us. It's going to be a lot of fun continuing uh, tomorrow morning because we're focusing on strong marriages this weekend and because, as many of you know, whenever the church family gathers at the Lord's table and we celebrate communion together, I really love to just read a story. And so today... I've selected a story to share with you that really puts skin on this statement of the apostle when he says, love keeps no record of wrongs. It's an old story written by Bob Constantine. Uh, It's been published in guideposts, Reader's Digest, a number of different books and journals over the years. It begins in early 1950 in the Taylor's small apartment in Waltham, Massachusetts. Edith Taylor was sure that she was the luckiest woman on the block. Been married to Carl for 23 years. And still, after all these years of marriage, whenever he would walk into the room, her heart would still skip a beat. They were still madly in love with each other. Now, of course, this is not to suggest that it had been an easy ride through these years. No, they had been through some really dark, tough chapters together. Carl fighting depression from time to time. Of course, there were seasons when he couldn't find meaningful employment. They always seemed to struggle financially, and yet they were still very much in love. As for Carl, he gave every appearance of a man who also was in love with his spouse. When his job as a government warehouse worker took him out of town, he would always write Edith a long letter every night. He'd also drop many postcards each day to her when he was gone on business travel. He'd send her small gifts from every place he visited. When he was at home, often they would stay up late into the night talking about whatever. One of their favorite things to talk about was to dream of the day when they could some they afford a down payment on a new dream home that they longed to buy together. Well, in February 1950, as Bob Constantine tells the story, government sent Carl to Okinawa for a few months to work in a new warehouse there. Early on, Edith sensed something 
was different. He didn't seem to send the long letter every day like she had come to count on. He wasn't sending a lot of postcards anymore. He wasn't sending any gifts. Now, she rationalized, maybe that's because he's trying to save up all of his money so that as soon as he gets back home, then we'll finally have enough to put a down payment on a home. She would call the new warehouse there and would get evasive answers. Oh, yes, Mrs. Taylor, Carl's here. He's doing well. He's just very, very busy. We'll make sure that he gets word that you called. But yeah, everything's okay. Well, what was supposed to be just an assignment lasting a few months stretched into well over a year, and that's when Edith got an idea. Why not buy their home now before Carl got back as a surprise for him? She was working now in a factory there in Waltham and putting all of her earnings in the bank. At last, she had enough for a down payment on a cozy, unfinished cottage with lots of trees and a beautiful view. Now the days sped past because she was so busy working on this wonderful surprise for Carl. Two months later, she had earned enough to get the floor laid in one of the bedrooms. The next month, she ordered insulation for the home. Now she was getting into a little bit of debt, but she figured with all the money, no doubt, Carl was saving in Okinawa, it was going to be okay. She worked feverishly, almost desperately, probably because there was something always in the back of her mind that she just didn't want to think about. Then came the letter, the bombshell, Dear Edith. I wish there were a kinder way to tell you that we are no longer married. Edith collapsed in the sofa. She read the rest of the letter that explained that Carl had written to Mexico to obtain a legal divorce. It had come in way of the mail. And yes, there was another woman now. She lived in Okinawa. She was Japanese. Ayoko was her name. She was the maid assigned to his quarters. Ayoko was 19. Edith was 48. Edith did not fight the quick paper divorce. And she did not hate Carl, or Ioko, for that matter. She did not obsess over getting even. She did not feed this sense of wanting revenge and vengeance. She could picture the situation well. A penniless girl, a lonely man who Edith knew sometimes drank more than he should. Constant closeness. But even so, she reasoned, Carl had not done the easy, shameful thing. He had chosen the hard way to get a legal divorce rather than to just take advantage of this young servant girl. The only thing that Edith couldn't believe was that he had stopped loving her altogether. That he loved Ayoko. She made herself accept that, and she could understand that. But the difference in their ages and their backgrounds, this couldn't be the same kind of love that she and Carl had known. Someday she hoped and prayed that Maybe, even perhaps with Ayoko, Carl would at least come back home. Edith now built her life around a whole new reality. She wrote Carl, asking him to stay in touch with her, to just keep her informed of all of the daily details of his ordinary life. She sold the little cottage with its view and its snug insulation, Carl never 
knew anything about that home. He faithfully started writing, Edith. He told how he and Ioko were expecting their first baby. Marie was born in 1951. Then two years later, 1953, she gave birth to another beautiful, healthy little baby girl they named Helen. Edith faithfully sent the little girl's gifts. She continued to write to Carl, and he always wrote back. Just the comfortable, detailed letters of two people who knew each other very well, talking about just mundane stuff. Helen grew her first tooth. Ioko's English was improving every day. Carl had lost weight. And then another bombshell. A letter that informed Edith Carl was dying of lung cancer. He was given weeks, maybe months, to live. Carl's last letters were filled with fear, not for himself, but for Ioko, and especially for his two little girls. He had been saving to send them to school in America, but his hospital bills were taking everything he made. What was going to become of his girls? Then Edith knew that her last gift to Carl could be peace of mind for these final few weeks. She wrote to him, explaining that if Ioko was willing, that she would love to take little Marie and Helen and bring them up, raise them in Waltham, Massachusetts. Well, for many months after Carl's death, Ioko would not let the children go. It seemed that's all she had anymore in life, but... The more she thought about it, the more she realized she did not have much to pass on to the girls other than the life that she had known, a life of poverty, servitude, despair. And so it was, November 1956, Ioko sent her two precious little girls to their dear Auntie Edith. Edith had known that it would be hard to be a mother at the age of 54 to a three-year-old and a five-year-old. She hadn't known that in the time since Carl's death that the girls would forget all of the English that they had learned. But Marie and Helen learned fast. The fear left their eyes. With time, their faces grew plump. And Edith, for the first time in six years, was hurrying home from work. She was finding great joy once again and preparing meals. Sadder were the times when letters came from Aoko, and they came often. Dear Auntie Edith, she would write, tell me now what they do if Marie or Helen cry or not. In the broken English, Edith read the loneliness, and oh, did she know loneliness. Money was another problem. Edith hired a woman to care for the girls while she worked. Being both mother and wage earner left her thin and tired. In February, she became very ill, but she kept working because she was afraid to lose even one day's pay at work. It was at work when she fainted, and they rushed her to the hospital. There she would spend the next two weeks battling pneumonia. She was teetering on the brink between life and death, and it was there in the hospital bed where she faced the fact that she would be old before the girls were grown. She thought that she had done everything that love for Carl asked of her to do, but now she knew there was just one more thing that she would at least try. She must try to bring the girl's real mom here to the United States to be a part of their family, to live in her home. She made the decision. 
But doing it was something else. Ioka was still a Japanese citizen, and that immigration quota had a waiting list many years long. Way back then, immigration was a complicated issue. Bob Considine now shares where he got personally involved in the story. As uh, a columnist for New York Times, he wrote, it was then that Edith Taylor wrote to me. I described the situation in my newspaper column. Petitions were started. A special bill speeded through Congress, can you imagine? And in August 1957, Ioko Taylor was permitted to enter the country. As the plane came in at New York's International Airport, Edith had a moment of fear. What if she should hate this woman who had taken Carl away from her? What then? The last person off the plane was a girl so thin and small that Edith thought at first it was but a child. She did not come down the stairs. She only stood there clutching the railing, and Edith knew that if she herself had been afraid, then Ioko was in a complete panic. She called Ioko's name. And the girl rushed down the steps and into Edith's arms. In that brief moment, as they held each other, Edith had an extraordinary thought. Help me, she prayed. Help me, O oh God. Her eyes shut tight. Help me to love this girl. As if she were part of Carl. Come home. I prayed for Carl to come back. Now he has, and his two little daughters, and in this gentle girl that he loved. Now, God, please help me to love her even as you love us. God answered that prayer. Together, Edith and Aiko raised those two girls to be happy, healthy, successful. And just at the sunset of Edith Taylor's life, she reflected on her long story, and she proclaimed, I am indeed the luckiest woman on the block. And now we come to the table. And we celebrate a similar love shown to all of us, a love that is patient, a love that is kind, a love that keeps no record of wrongs, a love that compelled the Son of God to spill His blood, to sacrifice His own body so that now, today, we, as the family of Christ, can gather as forgiven saints, rejoicing in His great love and in our sure salvation. Amen. And at this time, I would invite Pastor Jason and Wally, our head elder, to come forward as we will uh, distribute the bread and the grape juice uh, to the deacons who will serve you.
Let us pray. God, we are transported by this music into your spirit. And as we hold these emblems, we're, we're reminded that this bread symbolizes your broken body that bridged to us your mercy and your grace. And that the, the juice symbolizes your blood poured out as a river of life to fill us with forgiveness and with healing. And so bless them as symbols and bring the reality of their truth to each of us in grace, in forgiveness, and in healing, we pray. Amen. So church, Paul gives the account in his letter to the church in Corinth. And in chapter 11, this is what he says that happened. Verse 23, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He continues in verse 25 and says, In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. In celebration, let's all stand as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 633, When We All Get to Heaven.
God, how our hearts ache together for that day to be soon when we will all stand in your presence forever and ever and ever. In the name of Jesus, we pray that this day would come soon. Amen. Just a reminder, on your way out, it is our tradition here on Communion Sabbaths to collect a special offering that we use exclusively for members in crisis. And one thing we know is there will always be unexpected events in life, and your generosity helps us to weigh in uh, to help in emergency situations like that for one another. So thank you for your generous offering. Also, just a reminder, tonight the fun starts at 7 o'clock with Mark Gunger here. Laugh your way to a better marriage. Hope to see you tonight.